good evening. Um, as Andrea already mentioned, um, Albert Einstein derived the existence of uh, gravitational waves as a ra rather straightforward consequence of his field equations in 1916, a few months after uh, his successful derivation of, the gen of general relativity. Uh, nevertheless, 100 years passed between their prediction and their uh, direct detection. Uh, and tonight's guest is one of the few people who can explain in detail why physicists needed one century uh, for this groundbreaking achievement. Uh, Professor Sheila Rowan is the director of the Institute for Gravitational Research at the University of Glasgow and has recently been appointed chief scientific advisor for Scotland. Her research is targeted at developing optical materials for gravitational wave detectors. Her work has been crucial for the advanced LIGO upgrades that contributed to one of the biggest scientific discoveries of the century, the first direct detection of gravitational waves. Scientific achievements of Professor Rovan have been acknowledged with numerous awards. She received the Leverhulme Prize for Astronomy and Astrophysics in 2005, Royal Society Wolfson Research Merit Award in 2010. She was recipient of the Hoyle Medal and Hoyle Prize in 2016. And she's also, she also participated in a share of the 2016 Special Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics with the members of her team in Glasgow. I wish you to enjoy the lecture and we'll be back after the lecture for some Q&A and for some debate. Professor Owen, it's an honor and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for the invitation to come and talk to you today. And as we'll discuss as we go along, today turns out to be a special day for us. Um, I'm going to talk to you, um, as we heard, I'm going to talk to you about gravitational waves and gravitational wave detection. And to do that, what I'd like to do first is talk a little bit about gravity because we're, we're going to talk about gravitational waves, but an understanding of, of gravity sort of is underneath that. And in nature, most, almost all of the interactions that we understand in the whole universe are governed by four fundamental forces. And there they are. And at least two of those you should recognize and we kind of experience in everyday life. Gravitation is one of those. And it's one that we're quite familiar with because it's the one that holds us here on the surface of the Earth. And we experience it every day. We know if we, if, we, if we pick something up and we let it go, it will fall. And it falls towards the surface of the Earth under the action of gravity. The other force, again, that we're, we're more used to experiencing every day is the electromagnetic force. Um, and so magnets, uh, fridge magnets, that, that you have on the, on the front of your, your, your refrigerator are held there, again, um, by the electromagnetic force. So those we're kind of used to thinking about. The other two forces, the weak force and the strong force, we tend not to, to really experience in everyday uh, uh, life and everyday experience because they tend to be important at very short ranges inside atoms and, and particles. But if we think about the other two, gravitation and the electromagnetic force, and we think about the relative strength, how we, how we experience that, well, you kind of have a feel for what, this, the, the, what gravity feels like in terms of its strength, its attractive force. Um, if, you, if you think about how it feels to jump up and land back down on the Earth, you kind of have an intuitive feel for the strength of gravity. And to us, it feels quite strong. We, we, we experience it. But you can see here, I've plotted the relative strength of these forces, and actually gravity is by far the weakest. These are just an arbitrary units, but if you think of gravity, if you think about how that feels and, and give that a sort of unit of one, the electromagnetic force is 10 to the power 37, that's 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 and so forth, you know, sort of many, many times stronger than gravity, it's enormously stronger. All the other forces are. Gravity, in fact, is exceedingly weak in terms of, in terms of interactions. 
but it's a very, very important force, a very important force in the universe. And if you think about it, why is that? Well, it's because gravity comes in only one sign. Objects always attract one another. The electromagnetic force, you can have plus and minus charge, and the effects of that can kind of cancel one another out on large scales. And again, if you think about that fridge magnet that's held on to the front of your fridge, if it's close to the fridge, it overcomes gravity really easily. If you let it go, it will stick on to the front. But if you pull it further away and let it go, it will fall. It, 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 it is overtaken by the force of gravity. And that's because, because all particles of matter attract one another. And so the gravitational pull of things always adds up. And so on large scales, gravity is relentless and gravity tends to win. And it's gravity, really, that's responsible for both the birth of stars and the death of stars. If you think out there in the universe of, of clouds of dust and gas with every particle in them being pulled together under the force of gravity until eventually those form into clouds, clouds of hydrogen, the hydrogen starts to fuse and a star is born. So it's really responsible for the fact that we're here at all. And how things behave under gravity um, is described in, this is Newton here, Newton's law of gravitation. And it's actually quite a simple law. Newton's law says if you have two objects, mass one and mass two, some distance apart, they'll feel a force that attracts them. <clears throat> and the size of that attraction depends on the size of the individual masses and how far apart they are. And Newton's law works exceedingly well if we want to, to try and um, calculate how things, how projectiles move, if we throw an object, how it moves under, under gravity. Um, Newton's theory on the whole works exceedingly well, and it worked well for a long time. But <clears throat> it has a particular feature that's actually very uncomfortable. And it made, I think, back, if we look back at, at the time at Newton's writings, made him uncomfortable. And that theory of how things are going to behave under gravity has a, has a, has a property um, called instantaneous action at a distance. What does that mean? Well, if you think about our two objects that feel an attraction to one another, we said it depends on their respective masses and how far apart they are. So if one of those masses is the Earth and the other mass is a star on the far side of the universe, we would feel an attraction. There'd be an attraction between those due to their gravitational attraction. And it depends how far apart they are. So if that distance changes, if that star changes its distance um, from the Earth, the gravitational pull would change. And in Newton's theory, we'd feel a different pull here instantly. In other words, we would know instantly that something had changed an arbitrary distance away, far, far away. And that feels wrong. And it is wrong. And it took Einstein to come along, actually with Einstein's special theory of relativity, which has a, a, a prediction, a feature, that many of you will have heard of. Special relativity says no information can be carried faster than the speed of light. No information. That includes gravitational information. So actually, special relativity tells us that there must be traveling gravitational signals across the universe. There must be what we call gravitational radiation, traveling gravitational signals. So special relativity tells us that. But as we heard in the introduction, general relativity starts to really put into firm terms what that means. And this is a picture, and again, I think you'll probably instantly recognize Einstein there. He was, this is actually a picture of Einstein in Glasgow. He was getting an honorary degree from Glasgow. So this is taken in the university. And in fact, all those other people in that picture are also eminent people. Um, one of them, I think, is the former prime minister of France. Um, another one is the Archbishop of Armagh and primate of all Ireland, a religious man. One of them, I think, is the principal of the university. But today, I think it's interesting that the one person, I think, probably, if we went out into the street and asked people if they could, they could pick out of the picture who it was, that person would be Einstein. It's the scientist that we recognize. 
I like to think that's the power of science. Of course, it might just be the power of good hair, because he was in full iconic, sort of a recognizable mode at that point. Um, um, but he visited Glasgow, and that was, um, he gave a lecture, again, whilst he got his honorary degree, and he gave a lecture on general relativity. And apparently, again, there are few people alive now, I think probably no one alive now who really was there at the time, but rumor has it, it was pretty incomprehensible, and it was really quite hard to understand. Because it is hard to understand, relativity um, is a very mathematical formula, it's quite complicated. But fortunately, it describes the way mass and space interact in terms of geometry. So we can actually visualize, again, what, what general relativity is telling us about, about space, time, and mass, and how they behave. And what it tells us is that mass curves space time around it. So we often say that matter curves space time, and then space time guides the motion of matter. So if you, th you think of this grid here as a grid, in, a grid describing the distance between objects in space, between points in space, a mass curves space around it changes the distance between points in space. And then that curvature we think of as gravity. And it's gravity then that, that then tells objects how to move that curvature in space caused by the presence of mass. OK, so the, that's, that's the 3D picture. If we want to think about gravitational waves, let's just take a slice through that grid. Here's our mass, say our mass is a star, and what it's done is it's curved the space around it. We can think of that curvature as gravity, so you can imagine here if we put a second object down in space, it will try and roll down the curve towards the first one. The curvature, that, that is, is, if it looks to us like the two, two objects would be attracted to one another. Now imagine that object in the middle there moves suddenly, it does something, it wobbles. It's a star that's vibrating. Then that curvature will change. It will also change. And that change in curvature starts to cause ripples in space that propagate out those changing gravitational signals. And those ripples in the curvature of space or space time are our gravitational waves, traveling gravitational signals caused by the acceleration, the motion of mass. And that's what we're trying to detect. We have been working to detect. So I said gravity was responsible for the birth of stars, and it's also responsible for the death of stars. And we can, we can look at some of the sources of gravitational waves out there in the universe that we, we think should be there, producing signals that we want to detect. And one of those is the death of stars. So if we think in a star, a star a bit like our own sun, what's happening is, again, it's trying to collapse all the time under gravity. Every, every um, uh, piece of matter in there is trying to be attracted to, to each other piece of matter, and it's trying to collapse. In the middle, what's happening is that, that hydrogen is actually being, uh, in its collisions, is actually fusing into helium and giving out energy. And it's that energy that balances the force of gravity that's trying to cause the star to collapse. So the sun sits there and it shines. Well, that's fine until we run out of fuel in the middle to generate energy. We said gravity on the whole is relentless, and this is a case again where gravity wins. And so in large enough stars, the whole star, when it runs again through its cycle, its fuel cycle, collapses. It, it collapses under gravity. And the collapse is so strong that in the atoms, the protons and the electrons, the subatomic particles, are actually forced together to make neutrons, and we get a very strange object, something called a neutron star. And so we see this as a supernova explosion. So we see the light that happens when the outside of this is blown off. Um, at the end of that, we can either have a neutron star, or if the star is big enough, we may even form a black hole where a black hole, fundamentally, is the name we give to a region of space where the gravity is so strong that not even light can escape from it. 
you can imagine as this happens, that's our object in space suddenly exploding, causing ripples, gravitational signals sent out across space. Um, and, and, and that's a very interesting thing for us to study if we can see those gravitational wave signals. Why? Well, typically what we see are the outside of such events with, the, with, with telescopes. We see the light, um, we see other forms of, of electromagnetic signal uh, being produced, but we don't see what happens inside. We have to deduce what's actually happening when the star collapses. But these gravitational signals are caused by <coughs> mass moving. They're not masked by anything. So if we can see those, we can start to learn new things and try and really understand what happens when a star collapses. This is a picture of the Crab Nebula, which is a remnant of a supernova. It's a beautiful sort of glowing nebula that's, that's, that's uh, 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 the leftover um, uh, aftermath of, of a supernova a long time ago. And in the middle of that, we think there's a neutron star been formed in the supernova explosion. Now, neutron stars are very strange objects, again, with super strong gravity, much denser than we can imagine creating here on Earth to study, and we don't really understand what the material is actually like inside a neutron star. This neutron star is spinning, and we know it's there because as it's collapsed, it still has some, some charge. It's, again, a bit like a giant magnet. And so charged particles get caught in the field and accelerated round. An accelerating charged particle gives off radio waves. And as this star spins, it's like a lighthouse with those signals every now and again whipping past us here on Earth. So we, we know it's there from its radio signals. Now, if on the surface of this neutron star, if it's not perfectly spherical, if there's any kind of lump on its surface, imagine it rolling, rolling round in space, causing a dent in the fabric of space, sending out gravitational ripples, those ripples in the curvature of space. That's, again, the size of those signals would tell us about any, any lump on the surface of this star the size of, a, of, a, of a, a lump on its crust that can be um, sustained as it's spinning many times a second depends on what it's made of, what the material inside is actually doing, and there are different theories for that. We don't actually know really what's in there. So by detecting the gravitational signals, we can actually start to learn things about the inside of neutron stars. Say we have two neutron stars, or even two black holes, that have got caught in one another's gravity, and they're rolling round one another out in, in space. They're changing the curvature of space as they do that, sending out gravitational signals, losing energy as they get closer and closer together, <coughs> faster and faster, um, until eventually uh, they get so close together that they actually collide and give out a burst of gravitational radiation. Again, that, for many reasons, is a particularly exciting source to study, particularly for black holes, where black holes have the strongest gravity that we can actually imagine. And they're right at test testing the limits of general relativity in terms of understanding how our universe behaves. Sensing the gravitational signals from that, we think actually is perhaps the only way, in some cases, we might be able to, to, to study those kinds of events. And we're pretty confident these, these predictions of Einstein, again, we, we've always been, and well, since about the 60s, been confident that they, they were real. Um, actually, for a long time, people were, weren't sure that they weren't just a mathematical curiosity, that out of Einstein's equations came this, this sort of uh, equation for a wave, but maybe it didn't have any reality. And it took uh, measurements by these scientists here, and they're looking very happy because they got the Nobel Prize for their, their studies um, uh, of, of, again, a pair of stars, um, what's called the binary pulsar. Here's, one, here's a neutron star with its radio uh, uh, jets coming out the end. And again, that's a radio telescope, again, that was used to detect the radio signals. And what they did was measure how the orbits of this, this particular star system was changing over many, many years. And this is what they found. Again, this is 1975 up to 2005. 
the, and what they measured was, was how quickly these stars were getting closer and closer together. And it turned out they were getting closer together at exactly, pretty much exactly the rate predicted by general relativity if they were losing energy through gravitational waves. And so the dots are the experimental measurements and the line is the prediction from general relativity. And so that, again, was, was again, for many years, strong evidence that gravitational waves were being produced out there. And the question is how to detect them. Now, I've talked about, again, a set of possible things out in the universe that could produce gravitational waves. And those kinds of, of, of objects and events produce signals actually at frequencies that if we turned them into sound, we could pretty much hear in the, what we call the audio band. And detectors on the surface of the Earth are the way to try and detect those. However, there's a whole bunch of other exciting things, events, sources out there in the universe that could produce gravitational waves for which we would need different kinds of gravitational uh, observatories to study. And I'll talk uh, not too much about those, but I'll talk a little bit about uh, space-based gravitational wave detectors and what they might be able to see because the science is exciting. However, and, and again, we're, 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 we're thinking hard about those. However, what's important to notice is just like electromagnetic astronomy, where we have optical telescopes, radio, gamma ray, x-ray, different kinds of telescopes, to cover all the, the kinds of gravitational wave signals and gravitational wave sources, you would need a set of different telescopes in just the same way. It's a complementary kind of astronomy. So I talked about black holes and listening for, for, this, for merging black holes. So here's a, an animation where we have two black holes, again, causing space-time to distort. And along the bottom here, you'll see a trace. So remember what we said? We said that as objects move in space, they're causing it to vibrate. In fact, they're causing ripples, signals that are traveling out. And along the bottom here, the signal that you can see is, is the, the sort of um, stretching of space, the ripples in the curvature of space that you would feel a long distance away, thankfully, from this black hole merger. And I'll run that again so you can see what we're seeing there. So as they spiral in, we, we, they're causing space, they're causing space to distort, ripples to go out, and we're feeling, feeling the in-spiral phase. So space is being stretched a little bit as the, as the black hole spiral in, slows down quite a lot here. As they get closer, the signals get larger until eventually the two black holes get so close together that they merge and we get a peak in the signal as a new black hole is actually formed and then it actually wobbles and settles down. And we see this very, we predict this very characteristic signal, this wobbling of space caused by this kind of event. And indeed it was, and this is a special day, a year ago today that just such a signal, just such a gravitational wave signal was detected by the, LIGO, the detectors of the, the, the LIGO observatories, again, by the LIGO and Virgo collaborations, and there are a lot of people involved in this, this endeavor. And you can see, this is a, fig, a figure actually from the paper that was published in, in February this year, and it's free to download. You can go and, you can go and look at this. Um, but what you can see, this is the actual signals from the detectors, and there's, there's two here. You can see there's one in Hanford in Washington State in the US, one in Livingston in Louisiana. And this is the actual signals from the instrument. You can see the wobbles coming in, again, uh, from one instrument in red, the other one in blue. And if you overlap them, you'll see they match beautifully. The signal ar arrived first in one instrument, then in the other. And from our models, again, you can see the best fit to this looks just like those two black holes spiraling in to collide. And in fact, that's, a, that's exactly what we believe we detected were, was, was a black hole collision. And it's quite a remarkable event, again. It was particularly exciting. This is, again, a prediction, as we heard back um, by Einstein 100 
years ago and his general theory of relativity that these, these, these gravitational signals should be being produced. Um, it's the first observation of, of two black holes colliding and a new black hole being born, as well as the first detection of gravitational waves. Detected in the 100th anniversary year, uh, 2015, uh, of general relativity, and announced in 2016, the 100th anniversary year of the prediction that these things should exist. And today is the one year anniversary of that signal arriving here on Earth, 14th September, 2015. So there's that signal again, and encoded in that signal, that signal that we detect, that wobbling of space, that, that, that change in the distance between objects here on Earth, encoded in that are the properties of the object that produced it. And from this signal, we can tell that what produced it was two black holes, and here's that phase where they're spiraling around one another, getting closer together, merging, and actually wobbling slightly as a new black hole is formed. And there's an amazing amount of information encoded in that signal. Um, from it, again, we can tell that we can tell the distance out to the black holes when they collided, and and they were actually they, we know the distance was 1.3 billion light years, and remember a light year is the distance that light travels in a year. That's encoded in the shape. We can also tell information about whether those black holes were spinning as they spiraled round, each black hole spinning and coming into collide. We can tell the mass, we get information about the masses of the individual black holes. Again, uh, again, if we look there, we can see one of them was about 36 times the mass of our sun, the other about 29 times the mass of our sun, which as it turns out is surprisingly large. We can also tell the mass of the final black hole that formed, about 62 times the mass of our sun. If you're quick at the maths, you'll see the sum of the two individual black holes does not add up to 62, it adds up, I think, to 65. And energy equivalent to three times the mass of our sun was emitted in terms of gravitational radiation when those two black holes collided. And that's, a, at its peak, an enormous amount of energy. To give you some scale, the size of the final black hole, we can tell, all encoded in that signal, um, has a diameter of about 366 kilometers, which is about the size of Iceland. And we can tell that that black hole was spinning about 100 times a second. It's a, um, an amazing object. And a point on its, uh, its, its, if you like, its surface at the event horizon there was spinning thus at nearly half the speed of light. So these are really exotic, exotic, exotic objects. And this kind of event, we think, may have produced no electromagnetic signals, no light, no other electromagnetic signals, and only be detectable through the gravitational signals that we, we saw. And in fact, that was the first detection. Since then, our detectors have been running, and there was a second event announced that was detected on uh, December 26th here in Europe, we were calling it the Boxing Day event, in the US, actually that was Christmas Day. Um, and, and so there's a second black hole system detected, um, and those were big signals. In fact, the first one big enough that you could pretty much see it by eye in the data. Um, there was another smaller event, actually a smaller signal um, in October last year, which is small enough that we weren't confident to call it a, a detection, but if the, looking at the signal, it's consistent, again, with another black hole collision. And if we look at what those systems look like, and again, remember, their properties are encoded in the signals they produce. So there's that first signal from the, from the, 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 large, the larger of the black holes colliding. There's the, the, the Boxing Day signal. Again, it's a smaller signal, but we saw it in our instruments for longer. And, and the intermediate signal there, which we're not 100% cla claiming is a detection, but it's certainly consistent with one. So all, there, all that information that I've, that I've just given you, in each case, we can, we can get from the, the, the shape of these signals. And it really is new information that we get. So this plot here basically just shows you the size of the black holes. So there's, there's the two black holes, the 36 and 29, 
forming a sort of 62 solar mass black hole, 62 times the mass of the sun. And it was a surprise. This, e this event was really a surprise. We weren't quite ready for it coming. We didn't expect it to come so soon when we turned our detectors on. Um, but it also was a surprise in terms of the size of the black holes. So from electromagnetic studies with telescopes, um, looking at X-ray signals coming from out in the universe, people have deduced that there are objects out there that they think behave like black holes of a certain size. Um, and those are plotted here. And you can see they're all uh, within a sort of range between about five times the mass of our sun uh, and, and under 20. And with gravitational wave signals, the very first thing we detected was black holes significantly larger than that. And, and that was, was unexpected. And it actually starts to allow us to get new information. Um, having only seen black holes of the size, people, of course, have theories about how they're formed, what the stars were like that formed them. To see ones of this size starts to make people think in a different way about how black holes are formed and what the stars were like um, that, that collapsed and formed them, what their properties were. It's new astrophysics. So just to recap, what are gravitational waves? Well, they're a strain in space. They actually stretch space, change, it, change the distance between objects as space is curved. You can think of them a bit like ripples on the surface of a pond. There's a disturbance that, that sends ripples out across the surface. This time, though, it's, it's the space of our universe. And why are we interested in detecting those? Well, it's a completely different way to study objects in the universe through their gravitational signals. And it means we can and we have now the ability to study objects that don't emit light or other electromagnetic signals. So the question is, how do you do that? How did we do that here on Earth? And why did it take so long, as we heard after Einstein made his predictions, to be able to actually make these detections? So let's look more closely at what gravitational waves do physically. So here's a patch of space, patch of space on the board. And you can see our grid. And a gravitational wave that's been produced far out in the universe, it's come in across space, across a billion, billion light years, come in, it's come down, hit our Milky Way, hit our galaxy, um, it's come down, hit our solar system, it's arrived at the Earth, it's come in through the back of the lecture theater and gone directly into the board and passed through. As it's passing through the board, what it does to a patch of space on the board looks just like this. It stretches it in one direction and simultaneously compresses it in the other. So it's stretched in one direction, squished in the other, then it reverses sign. So we get this vibration of, of this patch of space changing the distance between points on the board. And that's physically what, a, black, what, what a, a gravitational wave would do. However, that was greatly exaggerated for effect so that you could see it. These are extremely small changes, very challenging experiments to measure those, those changes. So if we had objects, masses, points on the board, separated by about a meter, which is kind of what we had here, a typical gravitational wave passing through would only stretch that distance by about 10 to the minus 22 meters. So to give you some scale, the width of a human hair is about 50 microns, about 50 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. The size of a typical atom is about 10 to the minus 10 meters. So 10 to the minus 22 is 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 and so forth, smaller um, even than the size of an atom. So they're tiny, tiny changes that we're trying to detect. If we're going to measure those, we need a very good ruler to measure the change in distance. And effectively, for that, we use the wavelength of light. And we build an instrument called an interferometer. We take light from a laser. We split that in two with effectively a half silvered plate, a beam splitter. It travels out at right angles, bounces off mirrors. The light comes back, adds up again. And then we look to see what's happened to the light when it adds up again. Why does that help? Well, remember, first of all, we're trying to detect changes between points in space. And so what we're going to do is pick one here and one here. So effectively, a gravitational wave will move this mirror out and push this one in. And 
you know you can think of light as a wave. So effectively we have a wave of light traveling out this arm being reflected back again as one is reflected out this arm and coming back again. Now if the distance that the light travels is equal, say, we could have a wave coming back here at a peak and a wave coming back here at a peak. Those two peaks, just like water waves, would add up to give a larger signal. And we'd see a bright spot here. If, on the other hand, this, a, a passing gravitational wave has stretched this arm, pushed this one in, light can come back at a peak in one arm, but light in the other arm has gone a different distance, doesn't make it to a peak, can come back as a trough, then these would cancel out. So in one case, we would get a bright spot, and in another case, we'd get a dark spot. So gravitational waves passing by show up as changes in the brightness of the light that we see when we look here. And that is what we, that's the principle in which our detectors work. As you might guess, <clears throat> many things can effectively cause those mirrors to move by something that's much larger than a gravitational wave. I won't go through all of these, but there's some that are kind of more obvious than others. One seismic noise. As the Earth shakes, it causes the mirrors to shake, much more than a gravitational wave would. But we can get around that by actually hanging those mirrors as pendulums. It's a mechanical filter. So if we effectively attach the top to the ground and the ground shakes, the mirror actually doesn't move very much. Um, thermal noise. Every atom in those mirrors is shaking slightly because it's just at, at some room temperature. So they're all shaking slightly. We have to be carefully choose our materials to make the mirrors from to minimize that. Gravitational gradient noise. We've hung these mirrors. They're hanging there almost motionless in space. And a person comes and walks past them. Well, Newton tells us if you have a mass and a second mass and the distance between them is changing, there's a gravitational pull. And there's nothing we can do to shield against that. You can't shield against gravity. Um, luckily, people only walk slowly past the mirrors. So that only matters at low frequencies. People don't run 100 times a second back and forward past the mirrors. They walk slowly past. So it's low frequencies that, that that's a problem for. And that's one of the reasons we need to put detectors in space for some of the studies we want to do. In fact, to minimize the effect of these and maximize the effect of the gravitational wave, we want to make our detectors big. And so the detectors that I've been talking about are not small tabletop instruments. They are very large. The two instruments, the two LIGO observatories, here's a picture of one, a picture of the other. Uh, here's one in Hanford, one in Livingston in the US. Um, and you can see these are large installations. Um, they're, they're managed by Caltech and MIT, sort of here, um, uh, to run them. But actually, there's a large collaboration of 1,000 people who are all working on doing the, the, the work to build these, analyze the data. And it really does require technology right at the edge of what can be done. Just to show you, again, it's a very large collaboration sort of all over the world, North, South America, again, Australia, again, the group that I'm from in the United Kingdom, all working together in this. It's very much a team effort. Just to give you a bit of a closer look as to what they look like, here's a view down one of those arms of the interferometer to the center station. And you can see a couple of things. One, this is in a desert area in, in Hanford. Um, uh, actually, if you go and you visit, it's actually on a nuclear site in the US. And uh, every now and again, you see a reactor dome, and you drive a bit further. And then out in the desert, you come across the, the instrument here. And if we do a quick fly past, you'll see it's a large center station. There off in the distance goes this four kilometer long arm. That's the Livingston site. You can see it's not in a desert. It's actually in a swamp in Louisiana. Um, and it's a very different environment, but an identical infrastructure. Um, in this case, just out of interest, you can see these beautiful pools up the arms of the interferometer. And that's because it is built in a swamp. So when the instrument was built, it's actually built up so that the arms of the detector that the laser beam runs along inside here are built up on banks to raise the whole infrastructure above the flood level in the, in, in the swamp, which actually has been uh, successful. So it's such a beautiful site. A 
aside from worrying about uh, floods, there are additional challenges when you want to make these tiny sensitive measurements to do study black holes far out in the universe that people tend not to think about when we think about doing astronomy. So these are actually all pictures from the Hanford site. You can see it is in a desert area, it's very dry, and in fact there was a significant wildfire. And these are some of my colleagues standing on top of that central, central building, gazing thoughtfully at the wildfire in the distance, wondering what was, going to, what was going to happen. And actually, you can see what happened is the fire burned right up to the arm of the instrument. That's, that's one of those four kilometer arms. There are concrete covers over the instrument. And inside there, there's actually a, a pipe, uh, a metal pipe that all the air has been evacuated from with the laser beams fired along it. And this is burnt tumbleweed. A scorched on one side, and you can see not on the other, as it essentially acted as a fire break for the, for the fire. Um, and this is another hazard. Um, I said it was on a, on a nuclear site, and there are reactors there, which mostly produce, uh, I think, uh, uh, material for medical purposes. Um, but it does mean that there are uh, there's security there. And apparently, in the middle of the night, there was a drill. There was a security drill. And some security guards got called up, got out, rushed out, out into his car, set off across the desert, forgot that there was a four kilometer long scientific installation in the way, and drove straight over the top and right into the concrete cover. And you can see why those are there um, uh, into, the, into the cover there. So, in fact, the instrument was fine. You can see it didn't do any damage. He, it turns out, was fine. Didn't do any damage to him. His car, on the other hand, did suffer slightly. But when you're trying to measure these tiny motions of mirrors, um, these are all the sorts of things that if you're a student starting off in the field, you don't realize you're going to have to be an expert in a lot of things that you did not think about. And these are just some of them uh, to be successful, to make it all happen. OK, so the LIGO instruments are, in fact, part of a network, a, ne a global network of detectors. And scientifically, that's very important. So there's the two in the US. Um, there's a, another large installation in Europe, the Virgo detector, again, uh, 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 located in Italy, but again, with a collaboration. Again, there's the joint UK-German detector, GEO, which is smaller, 600 meters in Germany. In Japan, there's an advanced detector under construction in a mine, the Kamioka mine in Japan. And the LIGO project, again, will actually uh, locate a third instrument in India. India have agreed to host a third instrument. So currently, uh, GEO has, is smaller, but has been operating with advanced technology since about 2011. We're partners in the LIGO uh, uh, project. And again, the two observatories there operating, operating since 2015. Virgo is due to come online, we hope, uh, actually very soon again with CAGRA and LIGO India following a bit later. And it's important to have that network. And the reason is, is scientific, actually. We've said these signals are coming in from far out in space. But our detectors are not like telescopes that you can point. They're, they have some sensitivity to the whole sky. So if you see a signal, you're not 100% sure with one instrument where it came from. In fact, even with two instruments, it's not quite enough. And the way we tell where a signal has come from is by timing when it arrives in the different instruments. So obviously, a signal here would arrive first in Hanford, then in Livingston. In fact, the one we detected a year ago today arrived first in Livingston, which they, I believe they're quite proud about. And then a few seconds later, it arrived in Hanford, because these signals are traveling at the speed of light. We want to know where they came from so that we can work with our astronomical colleagues who do have telescopes. Because for some of the sources that I talked about, things like supernova, they, they should also have a signal that they can see in, in light as well as uh, gravitational signals. We want to tell them where to look. So we um, take our data, see if there's anything interesting, try and tell where it is in the sky, and send that out to our colleagues with telescopes to try and get them to point them. The challenge is, with just two instruments, actually, we can only tell to fairly large patches of the sky where to look. And telescopes typically could only survey small instruments. The more widely spread detectors we have, the better we can do. And for that first detection, just to show you, here was eventually our best estimate of where the signal might have come from on the sky. Taking the sky, unwrapping it, putting it down on the page, 
kind of somewhere in here, most likely in here, but could have been anywhere in here. And that's actually quite a large portion of the sky. And that was eventually our best estimate of where it came from. Initially, when we were trying to send them out quick information, it was actually a much larger portion of the sky we suggested to them they look at. And what this shows is, is each patch here is a patch of sky looked at with a different telescope. So uh, the green patches are people with optical or infrared telescopes slowing around trying to look and see if there was any, any counterpart signal there. And you can see they actually did pretty well in trying to tile the sky, trying to look for a signal. But in fact, in the end, we think the signal came from this direction to start with, we weren't sure it might have been up there. So these people were, were, you know, unfortunately, wasn't the best use of time. For the three candidates, again, the, so the two detections, the one possible detection, you can see together, they're huge portions of the sky. So it's not, it's not ideal to do that. If we add Virgo, again, the Virgo instrument, when it comes online, again, what it will let us do, what it would have let us do, is narrow in and really tell people where to look. So it really makes a difference to have the additional detectors. So what's coming next? Well, the detectors are off right now, being improved. We were indeed surprised when so quickly, when we turned them on in, in this, this state, we saw a signal. They're not yet at their design sensitivity, so we're still improving the advanced LIGO detectors. And in the next couple of months, September, October, we will turn them on again, and we're very excited about the, the, the possibility of not only seeing more black holes colliding, but seeing other signals, the other sorts of things that I talked about. Um, we'll work together with the network, looking not only for black holes, but these neutron stars, pulsars, supernovae, getting a completely different set of information than we can get using any other kind of telescope. So we expect soon to be seeing many signals, and when we do, of course we will want to do more. Um, again, we, uh, we, we're already thinking about how to improve these instruments to see further out in the universe, driven by the astrophysics that we want to be able to do. So on the ground, there's a lot of work thinking about making the advanced detectors better, and even new generations of detectors around the globe with advanced even more advanced technology. Because there's this whole set of science that we want to do. We, you know, is general relativity really the right theory of gravity? It has stood up fantastically well so far. We said though gravity actually is weak. It's, it's, it's got things about it we don't understand. How do matter, how does matter behave under these enormous gravitational fields, densities and pressures that we can't actually simulate in the lab here on Earth? The universe has to be our laboratory. We know from other observations, we believe that our universe, everything is not only expanding in the universe, it's accelerating in its expansion. Things are rushing apart. Um, we can use gravity as a different way to probe that expansion, again, if we see more of these signals. I won't go through them all. There's a whole set of exciting astrophysics we can do. And, and answer things that we, we potentially can't in other ways. With, again, this, this network of detectors around the globe. However, I said again early on, there's a whole set of things that produce signals. These instruments are just one way to detect those. There are signals that we can't detect here on Earth. In fact, for which we need to put a detector in space. And some of those are very exciting. You can see here, things like, <laughs> Things to do with supermassive black holes, not just a few times the mass of our sun, but, but, but thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe a million times the mass of our sun. And for those, we need to put detectors in space. This is a picture of the Andromeda galaxy, again, at the center of which we believe there is one of these supermassive black holes. And when this is, this is, this is two galaxies, this is something called the Mice Nebula, which we believe is two galaxies in the process of colliding. It's a beautiful picture. And why do we think it's, it's galaxies colliding and that that's what we're seeing? Well, you can run, uh, and people do, and supercomputers run galaxy collision simulations. And if we stop this one here and take a look at that and compare it with the Mice Nebula, you'll see that looks very similar. And we can let it run, and when we do that, you'll see the galaxies don't just pass through one another and keep going, they actually merge. 
And there's a whole set of these, these uh, uh, simu simulations that have been, have been done and, and compared to, to things we see out there in the universe. And what do we think is happening? Oops, excuse me. Well, if we run that again, there they go, and they're merging. And this time, if we do that and we strip the stars off the outside, what we have are the supermassive black holes at the centers of those galaxies that have got caught in one another's gravity that are spiraling round, taking the galaxies with them until they merge. So this is quite clearly a simulation. But imagine how exciting it would be to actually be able to detect the gravitational signals from this kind of event, supermassive black holes merging. And that's what a detector in space, we, we believe, should be able to do. The European Space Agency has selected a mission to study the gravitational universe as one of its future um, missions to launch. Um, and we've been working towards that. Again, this 2015 and 2016 have been big years for the field, both on ground and in space. Um, with a space-based detector, there was a demonstrator mission to demonstrate some of the technology uh, that was actually launched in December 2015 Lisa Pathfinder result, reported its results demonstrating some of the sensing technology, but this time in space, which worked beautifully well. So we're aiming to have this network of facilities on the ground. Um, again, there's, there's uh, research underway on the technology to make those even better, better detectors on the ground, and simultaneously looking at a detector in space as part of the range of telescopes that we need to cover the whole gravitational wave spectrum. And again, why are we doing this and why is it interesting? Well, again, many of you may know that actually, in terms of what makes up our universe, how much of that is, is stuff, matter, energy that we actually understand? Well, it's actually relatively small. Um, we know there's stuff out there that we give the name dark matter to. And we believe it's there because we see something having gravitational effects on objects. But we do not know what that is. But we see it through its gravitational effects. This acceleration of the expansion of the universe, we see, is caused by dark energy. Um, no one knows why or what that is. So we need new physics. We're actually at a point where we need new physics, and particularly around the area of gravity. Every time we've turned on a new telescope in the ground, we see different things. These are pictures of the, of the, of the sky taken in different wavelengths. Um, the very first thing we saw when we turned on our gravitational wave detectors, these black hole collisions, was unexpected. So as we turn detectors on later this year, I think we're very excited to see what more discoveries gravitational waves can give us. And I will stop there. Uh, thank you very much. This very exciting, very clear presentation. Uh, I'll just say a few words in Slovenian and then sure. I will switch back. Skratka, um, kotve jeste je zdaj čas za kratko debato. Prosil bi vas edin, če lahko vprašanja postavljate jasno v mikrofon, zato ker se snema, pa bo tudi na voljo na video lectures. Pika net. Um, in naslednja upomba, ki jo imam, je, če ste sledili predavanju, pa če bi radi zastavali vprašanje, pa bi ga raje zastavali v slovenščini, um, se lahko potem tudi mi, mogoče potrudno, ali pa jaz lahko probam zimprovizirati prevod v angleščino. Skratka, tako da boste lahko postavljali vprašanje, tudi če jih raj ne bi v angleščini. Um, ok, so, uh, do we have any uh, questions already from the audience? Um, Raise your hand, and we'll uh, we'll bring you the microphone. Uh huh. We have one. Thank you. Um, when you try to narrow down that um, field that these gravitational waves came from, you ask to look with telescopes, and I wonder what were you hoping to see, since maybe these sources don't give off any other um, radiation. So. That's a, that's a good question. So uh, this was a surprise to us, first of all, that, that what we saw was two black holes. 
So we've been working actually for many years in preparation with the astronomy community so that when we had potential signals, we'd send it out to them. So they were all ready to go. We, lit, we, were, really, we were not looking for, for two big black holes colliding. We actually, it was a great surprise. So at short notice, we sent out those signals. Well, again, we tried to understand what it was we had. Now, for two black holes, if they're out there in sort of empty space with nothing around them, they may well give out no other signal than gravitational signals. However, if they were in an environment where they, they hadn't eaten all the, the material around them, there still might have been material, perhaps, that could have given out something electromagnetic. And this is new. This is, this is the first time you know, we've been able to do this. So it's all new, it's n not off the table, and so it was actually very exciting, I think, for our, for our astronomy colleagues to uh, point their telescopes and look and see, was there something, was there any signal? So, so we're in new territory. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, we have a question back there. So there have been reports of uh, perhaps moving up the evolved LISA mission uh, now that NASA is interested in rejoining it. Uh, do you happen to know anything more about that? So um, I don't know any details. I'm not sure that there are any details of, of how that might happen. I think, so I should say the launch date for those who don't know, I think was possibly on the slides there. It's about 2034 was the original, is the current, I think, still launch date for LISA, so still some time in the future. Um, and it, partly the reason it's in that slot, it's the L3 slot, was, again, when those decisions were made, we hadn't detected gravitational waves, and LISA Pathfinder had to fly and work as a technology demonstrator. I think, um, you know, now both of those things have happened and Pathfinder worked very well, um, People are wondering, could it, be, could it be brought forward a bit? And I think there have been discussions around it, um, but I'm not aware that anything concrete has happened in terms of moving the date yet. Okay, I'll just uh, take this opportunity to ask a question of my own. Um, so it's been 100 years since Einstein's prediction of gravitational waves, and I was wondering, if you could show Einstein your results today, is there anything that would surprise him? Uh, how much did we learn about gravitational waves in, in theory um, since his prediction? Sure. Well, my guess is he'd have been surprised in, in a number of ways. And uh, I think he would have been excited, perhaps a bit amazed that we had managed to do this, because I think he was not confident you know, uh, in during periods that, that gravitational waves would be detectable. Uh, I think he also would be kind of amazed by the technology, and I didn't talk about that sort of much today. But, you know, various work, pieces of work that Einstein did actually fold in to the technology also that we use in the detectors. The fact that we've, you know, invented technologies along the way to be able to make these kinds of instruments work. Um, I think he, he would have been amazed, I think, in various ways and probably quite excited. That's my guess. Uh, <clears throat> hello. Um, how much time uh, does the signal take uh, from the beginning to end? And what does that mean in terms of how much time did the event take place? If the question makes sense, sure. even if the... So yeah. it only takes, it's less than a second, it's a fraction of a second, that the, the, the signal that we saw for the, say, the first detection, we see in our instruments for a fraction of a second. Um, and that's the time scale over which the, 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 the final stage is actually happening. Of course, the end spiral stage is going on for much, much longer but the signal's too small and at lower frequencies, so we don't see it in our band. But it's over, it's over very quick, it's over very quickly. Uh -huh. yeah, we have a question here, in the first row.
I was just wondering, um, you said that you need an instrument in space to detect, uh, to detect um, gravitational waves from merging galaxies. Uh, how so? I mean, I would expect that uh, the detector would be on Earth. It's, okay, so it's the frequency at which those, those signals are happening that means we need to put a detector in space. So if we look back, at this plot here. Again, just in general, the smaller something is, the higher frequency its, its signal is. So these are big things, so the frequencies associated with them are lower. And so on this plot here, here's our, our, our sort of black holes, compact stars captured, by, so, so this time small black holes, going, so, so solar mass sized black holes going round supermassive black holes. They're, they're at lower frequencies, um, things with, with uh, 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 signals that are, things that are happening on longer time scales. And you remember gravity gradient noise, um, we said was a problem on Earth, and that limits us. If currently, with our current instruments, probably at about 10 hertz, um, these are happening at, at, at lower frequencies. So we simply, the noise just goes up so quickly, seismic noise also at those frequencies that we simply couldn't see them on Earth. So by putting something in space, you get away on the whole from, from, from most of the gravity gradient noise, but actually with the spacecraft itself, things can move slowly. So uh, there's, a, there's a, a budget for gravity gradient noise locally caused by, by, a, by a spacecraft. But that's, it's, the, it's that, it's, the, it's where, it's the, it's the frequency of the signals they produce that mean we need to put detectors in space, different instruments. Uh, I would like to know, does it make sense to build an interferometer with three arms to be able to have the three special dimensions or two is enough? So, uh, in principle, I think you would, you would like another, another arm to get the other, the other direction. There's a different kind of instrument that I didn't talk about here that actually was the original um, form of gravitational wave detector, which is a bar gravitational wave detector, um, which basically was a big solid lump of material that as a gravitational wave went through, it would change the, the it would cause to vibrate. And for those, actually, people have thought about making spherical detectors that then actually are sensitive to things uh, e equally coming in in all directions. So, because although we are sensitive to the whole sky, there's an antenna pattern still of the instrument, and there are direct, with a single instrument, there are actually directions that signals can come in um, that the instrument is not sensitive to. So I think there is gain, but practically, remember these are kilometer long scale arms, and practically it's quite tricky to in do space. the third dimension. In space, there are different constraints. So in space, I didn't put up a picture of the detect, well actually, you can just about see here, the, the detector in space actually has three satellites. And there are different versions of the mission, but the original one, and I think one that people may come back to, actually has three arms, not one out of the plane, but actually three arms between the spacecraft. This, in, in, in this version, the spacecraft are five million kilometers apart, not just a few kilometers. There's a lot of room up there, five million kilometers, with laser beams fired between the satellites. And there, um, there are three arms, but you're a bit, you, are, you have different constraints in space. You've got to worry about how you fly this constellation of spacecraft. And so the orbits are carefully chosen. And uh, I'm, I, I'm not clear, but I suspect putting one out of the plane starts to be an issue with maintaining the constellation of the spacecraft in the proposal. It's a heliocentric orbit, so they actually follow the Earth round, and the whole constellation rotates in a very specific way. So I think there are probably different constraints in space in terms of how you can position the spacecraft and maintain stable orbits. That's my guess. Thank you. Um, I only want to know um, if you would compare influence of the expa expanded of the universe 
um, on, the re on the redshift of the light. Um, and, uh, and so I want to know if gravitational waves have um, some redshift too. Yes, you do have to take into account that when you're, I didn't talk about that, but all these, all this work does take that into account, that there are effects on the gravitational waves. Thank you. One more question about the detectors. You said you're using clusters, pro probably some high frequency, but uh, if I remember correctly, the order that you're uh, looking, observing, is 10 on the order, uh, on the minus 22, I believe. So, lasers are probably at least 10 magnitudes, the wavelength shorter. So, what is the 10 magnitudes? Is the intensity of the light or something like this? The, so, the detection in the interferometer. Yep. Uh, the wavelength is just the half of that, of the, okay, uh, of the yeah, limit. So, we measure to a much smaller we, we, we split the fringe, as people would say, um, to, to, to much smaller than a wavelength. Yes, and I by the intensity, over, probably. Of yes, the you measure the intensity, uh, 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 changes in intensity of the, the, the light yes. after the two waves have recombined at the output. And I showed the extreme case where you went from totally bright to totally dark. We're, we're of course, measuring just small changes in the intensity. And the laser stars, ultraviolet? Or? It's, a, it's a infrared. infrared. It's a 1064 nanometer neodymium YAG laser. Um, for, a, for, for, the, for the advanced LIGO instruments, that's about, it's a 200 watt laser. It's not 200 watt continuous wave. Not using all of that power yet. I think only about 25 watts at the moment. That goes into cavities in the arms and then is resonated up to, to sort of kilowatts. Um, much more than that, so. Okay, thank you. So, do we have any more questions? Uh -huh. One here. Please speak into the microphone. Uh, hi. Uh, how much would uh, space-time wobble if two supermassive black holes merged? On one meter scale. Gosh, um, I do have, okay. So I do have plots with that on it. No, so the so LISA is actually not quite as sensitive as the detectors on the ground would be, uh, if I remember correctly. But it doesn't need to be. The signals are actually uh, larger for those sources. I'm afraid instantaneously I can't remember the number for you, but I probably have it here if you want to come and look afterwards. Do we have any more questions? Perhaps one more, one last question. No, okay, then I'll pose one last question. Um, so, uh, you mentioned uh, dark matter in your talk, but, um, so I was wondering, probably you would need, if you would, if, if you would like to observe gravitational waves from, from dark matter interactions, you would need dark matter black holes uh, today, or, or not. And then I would have a follow-up question. Is there a way, uh, I don't know much about dark matter, but is there a way now, today, to tell whether a merger occurred from two dark matter black holes, if they exist, uh, or from two ordinary matter black holes? So, those are, those are good questions, and, and I think it's, so from, okay, so I'm not a theorist, again, and my theoretical colleagues are endlessly inventive, and actually after the detection, there was a whole slew of papers came out. I was surprised, sort of thinking about uh, exotic objects that behaved like black holes, but were not black holes, again, and I'm not an expert in this area. Um, and, and some of those were around the area of dark matter, and could, could gravitational wave signals help us understand it? So there are papers out there. Um, I think it's quite hard to, though, I'm not sure dark, dark matter seems to sit out there in, in, you know, clumps, you know, we can map the distribution, but understanding how it might produce gravitational wave signals, I think, isn't clear. It's not clear to me that that's one that we see a way that we can, we can help. However, I think what is exciting is 
Every time, as I say, we've turned on a new telescope in the electromagnetic wave band, people have seen things they did not expect. When you start to look, it turns out there are things there that you hadn't thought of. So everything actually I've talked about here today are things we've thought of. I think what's going to be really exciting is when we turn the detectors on again, um, that there may be things there that we just have not thought of. New phenomena you know, that we're going to see through the gravitational wave signals they produce that perhaps we, we haven't even thought of yet. I think that's uh, probably the best possible conclusion of uh, your lecture. Thank you very much, Professor Owen, and thank you very much for coming. And good night. Thank you.